Hello, today we will cover the objectives for week two. This presentation is in two parts, part A and part B. This is part A. Chapter five, pain. There are quite a few um, false beliefs that surround infants and their experience of pain. Right now, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that are not true and what actually is. So the first fallacy is that infants don't feel pain. The fact is, is that infants demonstrate behavioral, especially facial and physiologic, including hormonal indicators of pain. Neonates have the ability to transmit noxious stimuli by 20 weeks of gestation. Next fallacy is children tolerate pain better than adults. Children's tolerance for pain actually increases with age. <clears throat> Younger children tend to rate procedure-related pain higher than older children. Fallacy is that children cannot tell you where they hurt. The fact actually is, is by four years of age, children can actually point to the body area um, accurately um, or mark the painful site on a drawing. Children as young as three can use uh, pain scales such as the FACES scale, um, also called the Wong Baker scale. Fallacy is children always tell the truth about pain. Uh, kids might not say they have pain because they're afraid of getting an injection. Um, also because of constant pain, they might not realize how much pain they are feeling and not ask for pain medication. Fallacy, the kids become accustomed to pain or painful procedures. Um, often uh, what's true is that they'll demonstrate increased behavioral signs of discomfort with repeated painful procedures. Fallacy is behavioral manifestations reflect pain intensity. Here, um, what is true is that children's developmental level, coping abilities, and temperament, such as activity level and intensity of reaction to pain, influence pain behavior. Um, sometimes children with more active resisting behaviors might rate pain lower than children with passive accepting behaviors. Something else that is not true is that narcotics are more dangerous for children than they are for adults. Addiction to opioids used to treat pain is extremely rare in children. Reports of respiratory depression in children are also uncommon. By three to six months of age, healthy infants can metabolize opioids similarly to older children. So what kinds of things are we gonna ask kids? Well, we're gonna ask them to tell me what pain is. We wanna see, do they understand it? Tell me about the hurt that they've had before. Um, what do you do when you hurt? Do you tell others when you hurt? What do you want others to do for you when you hurt? What don't you want others to do for you when you hurt? What helps them most to take away your pain? Is there anything special that you want me to know about you when you hurt? So pain assessment and management in children. There are actually six core domains that are recommended for measuring pain in children. The first one is pain intensity. And here there's three types of measures. Uh, the first one is behavioral measures, and this is useful for measuring pain in infants and preverbal children who don't have the language skills to communicate that they are in pain, or when mental clouding and confusion limit a child's ability to communicate. Behavioral pain assessment may provide a more complete picture of the total pain experience when administered in conjunction with a subjective self-report measure. Physiologic measures are not able to distinguish between physical responses to pain and other forms of stress to the body. Physiologic parameters such as heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, palm or sweating, cortisone levels, transcutaneous oxygen, vagal tone, and endorphin concentrations reflect a generalized and complex response to stress. They are not localized responses to pain, but they provide useful information about general distress levels of children experiencing pain. And three is the self-report of pain. The next domain is satisfaction with treatment. Third is symptoms and adverse events. Fourth, physical recovery. Five is emotional response. And six is economic scales. 
Let's take a look at some of the pain scales. The CRIES scale. This assesses, and it's the acronym for CRIES, crying, oxygen requirement, so it's really requirement for oxygen, which is why the R is next, increased vital signs, expression of the face, and sleep. An observer will provide a score of zero to two for each of the parameters based on the changes from the baseline. The scale is useful for neonatal post-operative pain. This is often used between 32 weeks of gestation up until six months of age. Please feel free to look in your textbook for each of the exact components for each category. Please note we do want to medicate an infant uh, if they have a score of four or greater. The next scale is the flax scale. Here uh, it's good for ages two months to seven years of age and we are looking at the child's face, legs, activity, crying, and consolability. Again, each of these areas is rated zero to two. And please feel free to look at the text uh, for this table. Faces. Here, uh, this pain scale can be used uh, for children as, long, as young as three years of age. It consists of six cartoon faces ranging from smiling uh, for no pain to a tearful face with the worst pain. Uh, the child is then asked to choose the face that best describes their own pain and the nurse can record the corresponding number. And then once a child is able to understand the concept of numbers, that's when you can use the number scale. Often we will say eight years and over can use the number scale. Um, sometimes even a hair younger, they may be able to. Pain response by age. So the young infant's response to pain, in general, you're gonna see generalized response of rigidity and thrashing, loud crying, facial expressions of pain like grimacing, um, they don't understand the relationship between stimuli and then pain. Older infants response to pain. Here, they'll withdraw from the painful stimuli. They will cry loudly. Um, you will see facial grimacing and physical resistance. Um, the young child's response to pain, uh, loud crying and screaming, uh, verbalizations of, ow, it hurts thrashing limbs, they will try to push the stimulus away. A school age response to pain, here they will stall. They'll say, wait a minute. Um, they might have muscle rigidity. Um, they may use all the behaviors of a younger child as well. Adolescent response to pain, here they tend to be a little bit um, less vocal with their protests, less motor activity. You might see uh, more muscle, muscle tension and body control. Uh, they will have verbalizations like it hurts or you're hurting me. So what are some nursing care guidelines? First, we're going to talk a little bit about non-pharmacologic strategies for pain management. And just FYI, probably the most significant non-pain management for children is their parents' involvement and their parents holding them and being there. So that's very, very critical and cannot be underestimated. So some general strategies include consulting a child life specialist, using non-pharmacologic interventions to supplement and not replace pharmacological interventions. And these can also be used for mild pain and pain that is reasonably well controlled with analgesics. You wanna form a trusting relationship with the child and the family, express concern regarding the reports of pain and intervene appropriately. Take an active role in seeking effective pain management strategies and then use general guidelines to prepare a child for procedures. So when you are preparing a child uh, for a possibly painful procedure, you don't want to plant the idea in their head that this is gonna be like super painful. So you may wanna say things like, it feels like a pushing, a sticking or a pinching versus, you know, you don't wanna say, oh, this is really gonna hurt. And then you can ask them, 
tell me what it feels like to you. Again, we want to use non-pain descriptors, like it, it might feel like warm versus a burning sensation. Uh, this allows for variation in sensory perception and avoids suggesting pain, and it really gives a child the opportunity to um, describe their own reactions. Uh, avoid evaluative statements or descriptions, like this is a terrible procedure, this will really hurt a lot, obviously you don't want to say that. Um, stay with the child during a painful procedure. Allow parents to stay with the child if the child and parent desire. Um, encourage the parent to talk softly to the child and remir remain near to the child's head. Uh, educate the child about pain, especially when an explanation may lessen anxiety, um, such as, you know, the pain may occur after surgery, um, but it doesn't mean that something is wrong. Um, and also letting them know that they're not responsible for the pain. For long-term pain control, you can even offer the child a doll, which represents the patient, and then allow the child to do everything to the doll that is um, that was done to them. Um, emphasize pain control through the doll by stating, does the doll feel better after the medication? Also, you can teach family members procedures as well as the child for later use. So what are some specific strategies? I'm not gonna go over every single strategy that's listed here. Um, this is in your text. So some strategies involve distraction and what kinds of things can we do here? Um, again, you know, involve the child in play, using a radio, a CD player, a computer game, um, having them deep breathe and blow, at, blow it out until that's, um, they're told to stop. This can actually distract them if you're giving them a shot. Um, you can have them blow bubbles to blow the hurt away. Um, this might sound kind of strange, but you can even have the child concentrate on yelling or saying the word ouch um, as loud or as soft as the pain that they are experiences, they're experiencing. And then this lets the nurse know how much they are hurting and it also gives them an outlet. You can use humor such as watching cartoons or telling jokes or funny stories. Um, have the child read, play games, or visit with friends. So relaxation. So with a young infant or a young child, um, you can hold them in a comfortable position, um, really having the parents hold them and rock them rhythmically. Um, slowly, you don't want to bounce them because that can cause more pain. Also repeating, uh, you know, mommy's here, daddy's here. Uh, with an older child, um, you can also teach them relaxation, like to take a big deep breath and then when they exhale to go limp like a doll. Um, and you can even demonstrate this, uh, help them in a comfortable position. And you can even do some progressive relaxation starting with the toes and then go all the way up the body till each part of the body is relaxed. Um, often, uh, allow child to keep their eyes open um, because they might feel um, a little bit more relaxed um, with their eyes open versus them being closed. Guided imagery. So here um, you can just have them imagine uh, an experience that they've had that they've really enjoyed and go back to that place. Um, you can actually uh, combine relaxation with uh, rhythmic breathing. Um, and you can even have them uh, listen to pleasant music and um, have them describe very specifically details of an event that they've enjoyed. Positive self-talk here is just teaching the child positive statements to say when they're in pain, like I will be feeling better soon. Thought stopping. Here you want to identify positive facts about the painful event in the sense that um, this is not going to last long. It will be over much quickly. Uh, quickly, um, And then identify reassuring information. If I think about something else, it doesn't hurt as much. Um, behavioral contracting. This is something that can be used. Um, it's informal. It might be used with kids as young as four or five. So here it's like um, use stars, tokens, or cartoon characters as a reward. Um, 
give a child who's uncooperative or procrastinating during a procedure a limited time to complete the procedure. Um, and then you need to proceed as needed if the child is unable to comply. Uh, you wanna reinforce cooperation with the reward um, if they're able to you know, complete the procedure within the time frame. So formal contract, this is actually a written contract which includes realistic goals, uh, desired behavior, it's a measurable behavior. So you know they agree not to hit anybody during the procedure. Uh, the contract is written, dated, and signed by everybody involved. They identify rewards or consequences that are reinforcing um, goals that can be evaluated, uh, and then commitment and compromise requirements for both parties. While the timer is used, the nurse will not nag or prod the child to complete a procedure. So the traditional World Health Organization um, step ladder for pain management has been replaced with a two-step approach for use with children. This two-step strategy consists of a choice of category of analgesic medication according to the child's level of pain severity. Uh, so for children older than three months with mild pain, the first step is to administer a non-opioid, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. So these are your NSAIDs. And these are frequently used for mild pain. A strong opioid is usually administered to children with moderate or severe pain. Morphine is the medicine of choice for the second step. Please remember, what is painful to an adult is painful to a child until proven otherwise. I've never seen anything that was painful to an adult that was not painful to a child. Um, infants respond with their whole body to pain while older children can localize the pain. The preferred methods of pain management are oral and IV if they already have an IV in place. Uh, the dose for pain, med pain medication is usually based on the weight in kilograms. If a child is on narcotic analgesics, which are ineffective, you may need to either increase the dosage. Um, and if that does not work, um, then you might actually need to give them a uh, more potent medication. Uh, continuous infusion analgesics. Um, this is great because this helps to keep the level of pain um, down more consistently for a child who is in constant pain. A PCA, this is usually good for the first 48 hours after surgery for children around five to six years of age and above. Um, usually they use a morphine in the PCA. You wanna keep a handle on pain uh, because if it's not treated, then they're, they're gonna need to have uh, higher dosages of pain medication to manage the pain. You do wanna keep Narcon on hand and make sure you know the safe dosage range for the Narcan, have it already calculated um, because if a patient does have a reaction uh, to an opiate analgesic and they require the antidote Narcan, um, you're already prepared to know how much you need to give. Monitor for sleepiness, small pupils, shallow or decreased respirations for possible development of respiratory depression. Children at risk for, um, or an increased risk for developing problems with respiratory depression would be children that have um, altered levels of consciousness, unstable circulatory status, history of apnea, or known airway problems. <clears throat> so Demerol can cause CNS excitability, agitation, tremors, and seizures. We really prefer not to use it in the pediatric population. Uh, you do want to monitor for tol tolerance of the opioid medications, um, the need to use increasing doses of a medication over time to achieve the same desired result might indicate this. Um, if a child on medication for a few days with increased breakthrough pain, um, then the child may need an increase in the medication, as I mentioned before, or a more potent medication for the same effect. Know that a baby, if they are having ear pain, they might roll their head side to side. Um, and this can help us to know that's the problem. Also, if they're pulling at their ear, that also might indicate that they're having ear pain. 
So um, again, I already mentioned uh, some of the non-pharmacological strategies, so I'm not gonna go over those again, um, but it does bear repeating that parental involvement decreases the anxiety, and this can really be one of the more powerful non-pharmacological methods of pain relief for a child. Um, just also kind of FYI, just because a child is able to be distracted, they're being distracted, they still are experiencing the pain. So the pain is not gone just because they are being distracted. Sometimes nurses make the mistake when they see a child playing a video game and they will ask the child about their pain and the child says they're say they have an eight out of 10. And the nurse is like, they don't have an eight out of 10. Well, they do have an eight out of 10. It's just that they're being distracted. So please don't make that mistake. Uh, Emla cream. So this is a numbing type of cream. It takes about 60 minutes to work. And this is great for IVs or lumbar punctures. You do want to apply a thick labor, layer and then cover it with oxide or some kind of plastic. LMX4 cream is uh, also a numbing cream, uh, but this only takes about 30 minutes to uh, be effective. Um, it only lasts about an hour. Lat cream can be used for open room wounds as a numbing agent, and this is only effective for about 15 minutes. Next, we are going to talk about the concepts of death and dying. This is in your chapter 17. Between ages nine and 10 ish, this is when uh, kids begin to see death as real, irreversible universal and something that will happen to them. Uh, they can also see it as something that's violent and destructive. They can have um, very exaggerated concerns about death. They can have a fear of death and anxiety. Um, they can be very concerned with, you know, leaving their families. Um, and basically we're gonna talk about uh, the different age groups in terms of how they cope with death. Uh, we do want to encourage the child to talk to their parents um, so they don't feel alienated. Uh, this will be very important. So let's talk about how uh, infants and toddlers, um, what their concept of death is, what their reactions, and then some nursing interventions. So again, this is in a table in your textbook. Um, so concepts of death. So really death has the least significance to children under six months of age. After the parent-child attachment and the development of trust is established, the loss, even if temporary, of a significant person can be profound. Uh, prolonged separation during the first several years is thought to be more significant in terms of future physical, social, and emotional growth than at any subsequent age. Uh, toddlers, on the other hand, they're very egocentric and they can only think about events in terms of their own fame of reference. So here, uh, they really can't comprehend the absence of life because they're egocentric and obviously they're alive. Um, instead, uh, the issues here is more um, that they are affected by the changes to their life. So reactions to death. With the death of someone else, they may continue to act as though the person is alive. Remember, they can't understand um, death because they can't see it because of their egocentrism. Um, as they get older, they will be increasingly able and willing to let go of the deceased person. Ritualism is important. A change in lifestyle could be very anxiety provoking. Uh, this age group reacts more to the pain and discomfort of a serious illness um, rather than to the fatal prognosis. Um, also remember, this age group will react to the parent's anxiety and sadness because so they can sense that energy. Interventions, you wanna help parents deal with their feelings, allow them more emotional reserve to meet the needs of their children, encourage parents to remain as near to the child as possible, yet also be sensitive to the parents' needs. Maintain as normal an environment as possible to retain ritualism. If a parent has died, encourage having a consistent caregiver for the child. Um, and this, in general, when we're talking about somebody 
um, a child who's dying, it really is best to promote primary nursing. So preschool, their concepts of death are, they believe that their thoughts are sufficient to cause death. Remember, they have that magical thinking. Um, and because of this, they can feel very, very guilty. Um, they still have egocentricity. So they have that sense of being uh, very omnipotent and they can cause things to happen. Um, they have a little bit of connotation of what it means, um, but they think of it more as a kind of departure or sleep. Um, they may recognize the fact of physical death, but they don't really separate it from living abilities. Uh, it can be seen as temporary and gradual. It could go back and forth. Um, they don't understand the universality or the inevitability of death. So here, the reactions to death, if they become seriously ill, they conceive that the illness is a punishment for something that they thought or did. They might feel guilty and responsible for the death of a sibling. Their greatest fear concerning death is a separation from parents. Um, they may engage in activities that seem strange or abnormal to the adults. They don't have really very many defense mechanisms. Um, so here, a young child might actually re react to a less significant loss with more outward grief um, versus a loss of a very significant person. So they might have somebody that they don't really know very well and they hear that they have passed away and they might just be like crazy sad, but somebody close, um, they might not demonstrate um, such severe uh, uh, grief reaction. Um, and this could actually be because the loss is so painful um, that they are actually uh, trying to deny it has actually happened. Um, some behavioral reactions such as giggling, joking, and attracting attention or regressing to earlier developmental skills um, may show that the child needs to distance themselves from the loss. You gotta let parents know that it is very common for kids in this age range to be laughing and giggling. It's not that they think that it's funny, it's to remember they don't have the coping skills and this is their way of distancing themselves from the feelings that they're experiencing. Interventions, you wanna help parents again, deal with their feelings, again, allowing them emotional reserves to meet the needs of their child, um, help parents to understand behavioral reactions of their children, that giggling and joking that I mentioned. Um, encourage parents to remain near the child as much as possible to minimize the child's greatest fear of separation from the parents. If a parent has died, again, you want a consistent caregiver and again, primary nursing. School-age children, their concepts of death can still be a little bit associated with misdeeds or bad thoughts. Um, but because of their higher cognitive abilities, they do respond well to logical explanations and comprehend what death means. And as I mentioned before, it's usually by like nine or 10 that they have that adult concept of death. Um, they have a deeper understanding of death in a concrete sense, um, but they do have fears of mutilation and punishment uh, and that they do associate that with death. Um, you can give them a naturalistic or physiologic explanation of death. So reactions, because of their increased ability to comprehend, they actually might have more fears. Um, so the reason for the illness, um, is it contagious? Can they give it to somebody else? Um, they might be very concerned about the process of dying itself. Um, please note that the fear of the unknown is greater than the fear of the known. So this is why we often tell parents if a child is sick enough and they are um, dying, they really do need to be told this. Um, chances are if a child is that ill, they already kind of know. But if you don't let them know, that is actually scarier than knowing. The realization of impending death is a tremendous threat to their sense of security and ego strength. Um, so they're very likely to exhibit fear through verbal uncooperativeness rather than physical aggression. Um, they are very interested in post-death services and they'll ask you questions like, well, what's gonna happen to my body?
interventions, again, helping the parent deal with their feelings, um, encouraging the parent to be near the child as much as possible. Uh, but because of the fear of the unknown, you want to uh, prepare the child um, since the developmental task of its age as industry versus um, inferiority. So we want to promote that industry. Um, you want to uh, embark on interventions that help the child maintain control over their bodies and increase their understanding and let them be as independent as possible. Um, you wanna encourage children to talk about their feelings and provide aggressive outlets. Um, encourage parents to honestly answer questions rather than avoiding or fabricating euphemisms as I've mentioned before. Encourage parents to share their moments of sorrow with their children and then provide preparation for post-death services. Adolescents, here they have a, a mature concept of death, so they understand what death is. They still might have a little bit of that magical thinking and might feel a little bit of guilt and shame related to that. Um, they are likely to see deviations from accepted behavior as reasons for their illness. So reactions to death, so they are straddling between childhood and adulthood. Um, this age group actually has the most difficulty in coping with death. Um, they are least likely to accept uh, death, uh, especially if it's their own. Um, they are much more concerned with what's happening right now versus the past versus, and as well as the future. Um, they might consider themselves alienated from their peers and unable to communicate with their parents for emotional support, and then they end up feeling very alone. Um, adolescents are very uh, concerned with what's happening right now. So they might be more worried about how they look and their physical changes versus their prognosis. Um, because of their idealistic worldview, um, they may criticize funeral rites as barbaric, money-making, and unnecessary. So interventions here, again, helping the parents. Um, you want to avoid alliances with either the parent or the child. So you want to prevent uh, taking sides. Um, structure hospital admissions to allow for maximum self-control and independence. Answer adolescents' questions honestly. You want to treat them as a mature individual and respect their needs for privacy, solitude, and personal expression of emotions. Help the parents understand their child's reaction to death and dying, especially that concern for the present crisis, such as if they've lost their hair, that might be more of a concern to a teen. Remember, they've got that body image issue versus you know, possibly dying in the future. So in general, um, as a nurse, you wanna facilitate interaction between the parent and the child. You wanna provide an atmosphere for open communication. Find out what does a child know? What do they think? What are they currently feeling? Um, and then nurses can help children set limits on how much truth they can accept and cope with by asking questions. Um, things like, you know, if the disease came back, do you wanna know? Uh, do you want others to tell you everything even if the news isn't good? Or if someone were not getting better or more directly were dying, do you think he would wanna know? You wanna correct any misconceptions like uh, they may not understand what is wrong with them. Um, so when you ask them, what do they think is wrong with them? And if they say something that's not correct, you wanna correct them. Um, what is their big, biggest concern? Um, if the child is dying, be honest with them, let them know that a cure is not possible, but you'd still wanna give them hope. Let them know that they are gonna be taken uh, care of, um, their pain will be controlled, uh, they will be provided with emotional comfort. Let them know uh, that they are important and their memory will live on in mind and spirit. We do believe hearing is the last sense to stop functioning before death, so we do encourage the family to talk to the patient. Common behaviors, they might hide their tears, they may try to take care of the parents, they might be doing bad in school or act out. They might complain of somatic complaints like headaches and stomach aches. Um, 
siblings sadly are the most neglected after a child's death. Um, so we do wanna pay attention to siblings as well. Um, age and cognitive development obviously um, affect a child's reaction to death. And by going over that table right now, you can see that. During a chronic illness, siblings may be jealous because the sick child is getting so much attention. So that's something that parents do need to pay attention to. So what are some guidelines for supporting grieving families? In general, um, stay with the family, sit quietly if they prefer not to talk. Often we wanna talk to fill the void. Um, this is not the time to do that. If anyone's gonna be doing the talking, let them do the talking. It is okay if you, especially if you had a relationship with them to cry with them, but ideally you don't want to be um, distraught. Okay, if you are in such a state that you are no longer therapeutic, you may wanna have someone else taking care of this patient. Uh, accept the family's grief reactions, avoid judgmental statements like you should be feeling better by now. Obviously that's not a good thing to say. Um, avoid offering rationalizations for the child's death um, things like you should be glad the child isn't suffering anymore. Also avoid artificial consolation. I know how you feel or you're young enough to have another child. Um, deal openly with feelings such as guilt, anger, and loss of self-esteem. Focus on feelings by using a feeling word in a statement. Um, things like you're still feeling all of the pain of losing your child. Um, and then also refer the family to appropriate self-health groups um, for professional help if needed. At the time of death, reassure the family that everything possible is being done for the child, um, especially if they are wanting life-saving interventions. Uh, do everything possible to ensure that child's comfort, especially relieving pain, provide the child and family with opportunities to review special experiences or memories in their lives, Express personal feelings of loss and or frustrations. Things like, you know, we tried everything. Uh, we feel very sorry that we couldn't save her. Uh, provide information that the family requests and be honest. Respect the emotional needs of the family. Um, sometimes people need uh, a break from being with the dying child and we do need to respect that. Um, make every effort to arrange for family members to be with the child when the child is passing away, if they want to be present. Um, and then allow the family to stay with the diseased child. Um, basically, you're allowing them to say their goodbyes and even bathing the child, um, because that's something that they do before they take them to the morgue. And then, you know, offering practical help, obviously collecting any of their belongings and then arranging for spiritual support based on the family's religious beliefs. Um, if this is something that you're comfortable with and they want, you are more than welcome to pray with the family. So post-death, um, especially if the nurse has had a special closeness with the family, you can go to the funeral, okay? Um, you wanna initiate and maintain contact uh, often this is the case manager that might be doing something like this, uh, sending them a card. Um, they may have a home visit, especially if they were in hospice um, afterwards. Um, please refer to the child uh, by their name and please feel free to discuss shared memories with the family. Uh, we strongly discourage the use of drugs or alcohol as a method of escaping grief. It will still be there once you are off the drugs and alcohol. So you wanna deal with the emotions of grief. Um, you don't want to escape them uh, with uh, mind altering um, chemicals. Uh, encourage all family members to communicate their feelings rather than remaining silent to avoid upsetting an other member. Uh, emphasize that grieving is a painful process that takes uh, years to resolve. Um, and quite frankly, the interactions I've had with people that have lost children, um, that's really not a true statement. You don't resolve it. Um, you sort of get used to the idea and then some days you're not used to the idea. So it's just, it's a very, very painful process. Um, 
It is not uncommon to hear the voice of the person at times. You might have trouble sleeping. You may feel very depressed and empty. Uh, next, it, in relation to um, coping with death and dying, I want to talk a little bit about palliative care and hospice um, because this all sort of goes together. Um, briefly, palliative care involves a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach to the care of a child living with or dying from a chronic, complex, or potentially life-limiting condition. Uh, need is what talks about or what initiates uh, palliative care, not prognosis, unlike hospice where it's you're definitely um, usually in the last year of life. Um, so need is the primary reason to consult with palliative care provider. So palliative care for children is the active total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit and involves giving support to the family. It begins when the illness is diagnosed and continues regardless of whether the child receives treatment directed at the disease. Uh, health providers must evaluate and alleviate the child's physical, psychologic, and social distress. Effective palliative care requires a broad interprofessional approach that includes the family and makes use of the available community resources. It can be successfully implemented even if resources are limited. It can be provided in tertiary care facilities, community health centers, and even in the patient's home. Palliative care can be provided in tandem with curative and life prolonging treatments. And that's the difference between hospice. Hospice, that's not typically um, the case. They're not looking at life prolonging treatments. So hospice is a community health organization that specializes in the care of the dying patient by combining the hospice philosophy with the principles of palliative care. So they can be interwoven. Family members are usually the principal caregivers and are supported by a team of professional and volunteer staff. The priority of care is comfort. The child's physical, psychosocial, and spiritual needs are also considered. Pain and symptom control are primary concerns. No extraordinary efforts are used to attempt a cure or prolong life. So again, you can see how this is different versus palliative care. The family needs are considered as important as of those of the patient. Hospice is concerned with the family's post-death adjustment as well. So families could be involved with hospice for you know, a year or longer after the person has passed away. All right. Next, we're gonna talk about the effects of an illness and hospitalization on children and their families. And this is uh, chapter 19. So a uh, child's response to illness and hospitalization. So let's take a look first at the infant. So about six months of age, um, infants can be aware that they're separated from their parents. Um, they can identify their primary care caregiver, which is their, typically their mom or dad. Um, they become anxious with strangers if the parents are not there. So separation anxiety can occur when the parents aren't present. So what can we do as a nurse? Really that family-centered care is we wanna ideally have at least one parent stay with the infant um, and even doing as many of the ADLs as possible. Allow rooming in if the hospital has this available. Most pediatric hospitals allow one parent to stay with the child at all times, so they can even stay overnight. Um, and you ideally want to maintain a consistent nurse for the infant. So there are three stages of separation anxiety. So this is something that we can see in your infants as well as your young children. So the first phase is the phase of protest. And this is observed behavior during the later infancy. Here you can see the child crying, screaming, searching for their parent with their eyes. They will cling to the parent. They will avoid and reject contact with strangers. 
um, additional behaviors that you might see during toddlerhood would be things like them uh, telling the stranger to go away. Um, they might physically attack the stranger. Um, they'll try to escape to go find the parent. Um, they'll physically try to force the parent to stay. And know that these behaviors can actually last from hours to days. Protests such as crying may be continuous and it might only stop when they become physically exhausted. Know that the approach of a stranger, so obviously this could be a care provider, uh, like a nurse, um, can pre precipitate um, protest activities. The next phase is the phase of despair. Here, observed behaviors would be things like the child withdraws from others, they're inactive, depressed, sad, they're not interested in their environment, they may not communicate, um, they may regress, so they might start thumb sucking if they hadn't done that in the past, they might start bedwetting when they were potty trained, um, and things of that nature. The behaviors can last for a variable length of time. The child's physical condition may actually deteriorate because they may stop eating or not drink or not physically move. Phase three, um, the good thing is, is that um, phase three is rarely seen in hospitalized children because uh, fortunately they aren't in the hospital typically that long. Um, but you should know it anyways. Um, so phase three is detachment or denial. Here you're gonna see that the child looks like they're interested in their surroundings. They interact with strangers or caregivers. Um, they are forming new but superficial relationships. They actually appear happy. Um, detachment usually occurs after a prolonged separation from the parent. Um, behaviors represent a superficial adjustment to the loss. Um, Post-hospital behaviors in children. So this is box 19-2. Uh, so what kinds of things will you see in the young child? Um, here they might show initially um, being aloof towards their parents. This can last from a few minutes to a couple days. Um, usually it's just a few minutes. Um, this is frequently followed by dependency behavior. So they might be very clingy and want attention and not want the parent to um, like go away, so they may not want to go with a babysitter, or go to school or things like that. Other behaviors might include um, new fears like nightmares, um, resistance to going to bed or waking at night, withdrawal and shyness, hyperactivity, tantrums, food peculiarities, um, attachment to a blanket or toy, and they can even regress. Older children, things that you might see would be emotional coldness followed by intense de demanding dependence on parents, um, anger towards their parents, and they can even have jealousy towards others like their siblings. So risk factors that increase children's vulnerability to the stressors of a hospitalization. So there are some things that can make uh, being in the hospital um, more uh, uh, problematic. So things that will increase their vulnerability would be things that like a child that has a difficult temperament, um, a child that has a lack of fit between the child and a parent, your younger children. So, you know, children from anywhere from six months to five years of age um, also have an increased vulnerability to being in the hospital. Males, below average intelligence, and then multiple and continuous stressors like someone who's frequently in the hospital. Factors that affect parents' reactions to their child's illness. So here you're gonna see seriousness of the threat to the child. Obviously that's gonna affect how the parent reacts. Previous experience with illness or hospitalization, medical procedures involved in diagnosis and treatment, available support systems, personal ego strengths, previous coping abilities, additional stresses on the family system, cultural and, rel and religious beliefs, communication patterns among family members. So siblings' reactions. Siblings will experience loneliness, fear, and worry, as well as anger, resentment, and jealousy and guilt. Siblings may feel jealous due to decreased personal attention. They may be anxious and fearful that their sibling will die. So you do want to give them information. Tell them what's happening. They might feel guilty for fighting or being mean or feel that they caused the illness to happen. 
Sibling visitation is beneficial to the parent, sibling, and patient. Um, please prepare the siblings uh, with developmentally appropriate information. So what is some nursing care of the child who is hospitalized? So you want to ideally maintain the child's routine, if possible, time structuring, um, allow the child to do the care that they are capable of doing. We still encourage them to do schoolwork and we encourage friends and visitors. So remember a toddler preschooler, they can have uh, that transductive reasoning where they can see two unrelated events as cause and effect, like a dog's tail hit them in the stomach so they got appendicitis, um, or they have that magical thinking so they can uh, think they can cause things to happen. Um, preschools especially have that body mutilation fear. Um, separation is a stressor. So something that you can do is if the parent really cannot be there, you know, leaving a recording of the parent's voice with a story on it would be great um, or a message for the child. Um, leaving an article of the ch uh, parent's clothing with the child because um, that smells like the parent. Um, having the parent present for rituals like a bedtime story or a special song. Um, tell the child uh, why this is not to do with the parents, but when you're going to be doing a procedure um, with kids, you don't want to prepare them, your younger ki kids at least, you don't want to tell them a long time before. You're going to tell them like right before you're going to do it. Um, you want to ideally do a procedure that is not going to be comfortable in the treatment room because you want to keep their bed area and their room area as a safe space. Um, give them a choice if any are available. Let them scream, comfort them afterwards, and then give them a treat uh, if possible, like a sticker. Um, a primary nursing goal is to prevent separation, particularly in children younger than five years of age. So here's a little example of how you can uh, maintain the child's routine. And this is something you can write on their whiteboard in their room, just letting them know what is the schedule. So here uh, we can encourage independence, um, know that they sleep uh, less in the hospital because of frequent interruptions. Um, when we're looking at how nurses care for the child as well as the family, we do wanna accept cultural, socioeconomic and their values. Um, discharge does uh, start with admission, meaning that we are planning the child's um, discharge uh, once they come in, because we want to know uh, what's going on and if they have any needs. So if you can anticipate problems with discharge early on, that makes discharge much easier. Um, note that when parents understand and are well informed, they are more likely to remain uh, with the child. Uh, clear understanding of what to expect from you and what is expected of them is beneficial. So uh, preparation for hospitalization. Um, parents are often very anxious and fearful. Um, so if the hospitalization is planned, have the family take a tour or you can do a puppet show in advance for the child based on their age. Um, let the child see and play with equipment that might be used. So a stethoscope um, or anything that's gonna be used, letting them play with it in a safe manner can help to decrease fears. Um, parents can prepare children by reading stories to them and using coloring books that reinforce the information that they need to know. So when there's an unexpected admission, you do wanna orient the parents as well as the child if they're old enough to understand, orient them to the environment. So, you know, tell them how to use the call light as well as the bed, um, orient them to the routine, what should they expect, um, answer any of the questions. Um, as I mentioned, you know, uh, explain the call light, the remote control for the TV, the bed, the bathroom. Um, also talking to them about the child life specialist and any uh, play activities that are available. Um, please note that if there are other multiple teens that have uh, similar problems, um, teens might want to talk to other teens who have similar experiences for support. 
let's talk a little bit about therapeutic play techniques. So what's the function of play in the hospital? Basically, it provides diversion and brings about relaxation. It helps a child feel more secure in a strange environment. It lessens the stress of separation and the feeling of homesickness. It provides a means for release of tension and expression of feelings. It encourages interaction and development of positive attitudes towards others. Uh, provides an expressive outlet for creative ideas and interest. It provides a means for accomplishing therapeutic goals. Um, and obviously here in chapter 20, you can uh, see the use of play and procedures. Um, and it places a child in an active role and provides opportunity to make choices and be in control. It often can help nurses gain insight into the child's needs and feelings. And then it also can give the child a sense of control over scary events, relaxation, diversion. It can decrease homesickness and then increase interactions with others. So stories, here you can have a child tell a story about an important experience that they've had. Um, the caregiver can make up a story explaining the illness and hospitalization, including emotions that they might feel. Uh, dramatic play is a well-organized technique for emotional release. This allows the child to reenact frightening or puzzling hospital experiences. You can also provide dolls and equipment for play sessions, um, again, making sure that they are going to be safe. So toddlers, they can have that separation and stranger anxiety in the hospital. You want to approach them slowly to decrease that stranger anxiety. It is best if the parents are there. You know, playing peekaboo for the idea of object permanence, read stories. Um, a doll can be used to express feelings by recreating a stressful procedure. Let them play with soft hospital equipment with supervision only, like needleless syringes, stethoscopes, and bandages. Um, also let them play with home toys like pool toys or blocks. Often the child life specialist has an array of toys appropriate for a wide variety of ages. Preschoolers, dolls can be used to um, have the child talk about their fantasies, fears of mutilation and harm. Let them play with safe hospital equipment as well. Crayons, coloring books, recorded stories and Play-Doh and mag magnetic boards are also useful. School age. So play therapy, especially in your older school age, really is less important. Know that they might regress. Dolls can be used to discuss cause and treatment of illness in the younger school age child. They may want to keep stuff um, used on them to tell their friends. Remember, uh, your school age kids enjoy collecting things. Uh, play should promote self-mastery like games, books, crafts, CDs, computers. Uh, and as I mentioned, they do like to collect things. So they may want to collect stuff that they've played with um, or they've colored in the hospital. Adolescents. So here they need recreation versus play. So what are we going to do here? Maybe allowing them to call their friends, let them come visit. Um, have a video night or a pizza night on the unit, um, letting them visit with other teens on the unit. Um, you want to give them options in their care and recreation to allow for independence. So how can we maximize the potential benefits of hospitalization and really let the parents and uh, kids uh, be aware of what are the potential benefits? So know that they can uh, foster parental and child relationships, um, that the benefits of hospitalization can provide educational opportunities, promote self-mastery, provide socialization, recovery from illness, of course, increased coping, mastering of stress and feelings of being competent in coping, and new socialization experiences. So we really do want to encourage parents to participate. Preventing or minimizing separation is a key nursing goal with the child who is hospitalized, but maintaining parent-child contact is also beneficial for the family. Uh, we do want to facilitate the parent's active participation in their child's care. Chapter 20. This is the pediatric variations of nursing interventions. Much of this will be covered in skills lab, 
So I'm not going to be going over each individual skill, but you are responsible for knowing that for the exam. Um, so we're just going to highlight uh, some of the content in this chapter, but please remember you are responsible for all of the content in chapter 20. So first let's talk about legal and ethical issues. Informed consent. Uh, I know this is a repeat, but it bears repeating. Uh, this is something that you were taught in other classes. So the doctor needs to obtain the informed consent legally, but the nurse may witness and respond to questions. Uh, the doctor needs to explain, you know, what is the treatment? What are the benefits and risks? Uh, what are alternative treatments and what happens if they have no treatment? Uh, components of informed consent is you are a legal competent adult. Uh, please note there are some exceptions to that. Um, you need to receive the necessary information to make the decision is what we just discussed. And you need to voluntarily make a decision without force or coercion. So children under 18 may give informed consent in some very particular circumstances. So if they are the minor parent of a child, such as a 15 year old uh, gives birth to a child, then obviously they can consent for that child. They can also consent for their reproductive care. Uh, if they are an emancipated minor, so they are under the age of 18, not under the parent's control, uh, maybe they are in the military at 17 because a parent signed, so they are now considered an emancipated minor. If they are married, living independently, or it was legally granted by a judge. So uh, there is something called a mature minor. Um, in the state of California, it's actually age 12. I believe your textbook says 14 to 18, but California, it is a little bit younger. And this is where they can uh, seek care regarding their reproductive care, mental health, or substance abuse without parental consent. Um, there is something called assent, and this is a child seven or older should be given information and questions answered. Um, and we want them to ideally voluntarily to agree to participate in the treatment. Um, although this is not a legal requirement, it is considered an ethical one. So let's take a look at child's rights versus parents' rights. Um, in general, parents rule unless uh, the parent's choice does not allow for life-saving treatment for a child, like Jehovah's Witness, if the child requires a blood transfusion due to an emergency, um, they may get a court order. Conflict of interest, like child abuse. Uh, the parents are incapacitated, so there's an emergency, there's a car accident, emergency care can be provided without consent. Uh, parents have what we call like a durable power of attorney. They describe what can be done. Um, they make decisions regarding uh, do not resuscitate, um, advanced directives in terms of uh, how to handle the remains of the child, whether or not um, they want to donate organs for transplantation. So they would um, talk with the one legacy people in terms of um, donating their organs for somebody else to use. Uh, kids, they don't sign advanced directives because they're not obviously not a legal adult. Um, just kind of FYI, ideally we do not interview or examine teens 100% uh, of the time with the parents in the room. We do want to have some time alone with the teens so we can um, talk to them and so they will be open and forthright with everything that we want to assess. Um, know that they do have a right to confidentiality to a point. Um, inform the team that there are some exceptions to that confidentiality, like thoughts of some homicide or suicide or abuse or anything that's illegal. Like if, if they are raped, obviously that's something that has to be reported to the police. Or if somebody is shot or stabbed, that can't be kept confidential. Um, so for teens 12 and over, we will do use something called a HEADS assessment. And ideally we do that HEADS assessment with um, the child alone. So they will talk about their home, education activities, um, the D is the diet, drugs, depression, S is safety, um, their sexuality, and suicide. So what are some general guidelines for preparing children for procedures? 
So we want to first figure out, you know, what exactly is going to be done, and then what is the parents and child's understanding, and then figure out what a we going to teach and how are we going to teach them based on their developmental age and what do they currently know. You can incorporate the parents into the teaching process um, and then even inform the parents of what their role is during the procedure. So if they're going to be present, you can have them standing near the head or in the child's line of vision talking softly to the child. Um, although you want to prepare everybody uh, you also want to avoid issues with um, information overload. Uh, use concrete terms and visual aids can be very beneficial. Uh, let them know uh, only one body part or let them know what body part will be involved and that no other body part is involved if that's the case. Um, know that uh, sometimes they can be um, a little bit confused in the sense that if a child, let's say they're having a tonsillectomy, they might think that they can no longer swallow. Um, so let them know that uh, just because they had their tonsil out, they can still talk, they can still swallow, and that the body part that's associated with that function has not changed, if that's the case. Um, you wanna avoid uh, phrases that have two meanings, um, clarify, all unfamiliar words, um, allow the child, <coughs> excuse me, allow the child to practice procedures that will require cooperation. So things like using an incentive spirometer, have them practice that before surgery. So when you want them to do that after surgery, they already know how to do it. Um, when discussing uh, procedures that might be uncomfortable, what you're gonna to want to do is let them know that things feel differently to others. Um, then you can also uh, let the child know that, um, as I mentioned, things feel differently to others. And then you can have them describe to you how it felt for them. Stress the positive benefits of the procedure. Like if they had tonsils removed, guess what? Once your tonsils are gone, you're not going to have as many sore throats. So let them know how what's happening to them is going to benefit them in the future. So next, we're going to talk about um, how to prepare kids uh, specific for procedures based on their um, age group. So note that uh, components that have the little star next to it those uh, apply to people of, you know, or children of any age, okay? Um, so uh, obviously, you know, the first one, it says infant, and it says attachment to infant, involve parents in procedure if desired. So that's not just for the infant, that's for all kids. Um, so other things that we want to take a look at, um, again, keeping that parent in the infant's line of vision, um, if they're not able to be with the infant, uh, having a familiar object with the infant, like a stuffed toy would be beneficial. So they can experience stranger anxiety. So what can we do for that? Have the usual caregivers perform or assist with the procedure. Um, don't have a bunch of strangers entering the room during the procedure. This is why sometimes when students ask, uh, can I go into the room to see? Well, Sometimes, yeah, it's, well, are more than happy to let you do that, but sometimes no, because of this. <clears throat> uh, sensory motor phase of learning. So here we can use that for soothing measures like stroking the skin, talking softly, giving a pacifier, um, using analgesics uh, to control discomfort, cuddle and hug after a stressful procedure, and then again, encouraging the parent to comfort the child. Uh, increased muscular control. So here, uh, older infants might resist. So make sure that you restrain them adequately and then keep harmful objects out of their reach. They can have memory for past experiences. So your older infants, they might see something that caused them pain in the past. So as soon as they see that object, 
that they're going to cry. So this is why you'll often see nurses walking into a patient room with the, if they're going to be giving a shot, the shot behind their backs. That way they can't see it. Uh, so next, we're going to say keeping frightening objects out of view. Perform painful procedures in a separate room, not in the crib. Like I said before, you use a treatment room. Use non-intrusive procedures whenever possible, like an axillary temp or oral temperature. And then again, imitating uh, the gestures that you want the child to do. So um, if you want them to open their mouth, then you open your mouth too. So the toddler, you're going to use some of the same approaches as for the infant, as well as remember the toddler has that egocentric thought. So you want to explain procedures in relation to what they will see, hear, taste, smell, and feel. Um, let them know that if you need them to lie still, you want to tell them what you want them to do. Also tell them it's okay to cry. Um, that's perfectly fine. Um, know that... Uh, the child could try to run away. Um, you want to use firm and direct approach. Um, we ignore temper tantrums, just like we tell parents to do that as well. Um, we try to use distraction techniques. And again, really restraining adequately. If you need to do something that the child needs to be restrained, you need enough people to keep the child still because that prevents uh, the child from being injured as well as the healthcare providers. Animism, again, keeping frightening objects out of view really as long as possible. Uh, limited language skills, so you want to communicate using behaviors. Uh, use a few simple terms that are familiar to the child. Give one directions at a time. So you, know, you want to tell them lie down. Don't tell them four different things at once because they won't be able to follow those instructions. Um, use small replicas of equipment to let the child play with. Um, and again, using play, uh, demonstrate on a doll, um, but you don't want to use a child's favorite doll. Um, and then you want to uh, prepare parents separately because the child could misinterpret things that you're saying. They do have a limited concept of time, so you want to uh, prepare the child really, like I said, immediately before the procedure. Keep te teaching sessions short, no longer than five or ten minutes. Um, have everything prepared before involving the child. You also want to have extra equipment nearby. So um, if you need to do a uh, fully catheter insertion, make sure you've got two, because that way, if something happens, you're not like running away to go get more stuff. Also let the child know when the procedure is completed. Uh, striving for independence, again, allow choices whenever possible, but obviously the child might be very resistant. Um, so here, um, also allowing a child to participate in care and help whenever possible. Um, so you can ask them to hold something in place, right? Um, but make sure that this is they are going to be able to do that. So preschooler, these still have um, that egocentric thought. So you want to explain the procedure in simple terms and in relation to how it affects the child. Um, demonstrate use of equipment. Allow the child to play with miniature or actual equipment. Encourage playing out the experience on a doll both before and after the procedure to clarify any misconceptions. Um, again, use neutral words. We don't really like to use the word shot, but you can say, we're gonna put some medicine underneath your skin, right? Doesn't that sound much nicer? Um, you wouldn't wanna use the word anesthesia. They don't know what that is, but we can say we're gonna, they're gonna be in a special kind of sleep. So their language skills are um, increasing. Uh, so again, you can use verbal explanations, but you don't wanna overestimate what the child understands. And we do wanna encourage the child to verbalize ideas and feelings. Uh, concept of time and frustration tolerance is still limited. So uh, the teaching sessions can be, you know, maybe a little bit longer, so 10 to 15 minutes um, and it's, perfectly fine to divide information into more than one session. Remember, they can think that their illness and hospitalization is a punishment. So you need to explain why each procedure is performed, um, even though that child will have a hard time understanding that medicine or procedures can make them feel better. Um, you still wanna let them know that. They also don't understand how uh, medicine can taste awful and make them feel better at the same time. 
um, you can ask the child uh, what they're thinking or feeling um, uh, in terms of why a procedure is being performed and let them know that they did nothing wrong, that they are not being punished because of everything that we are having to do, it's necessary treatment. So animism, again, uh, you wanna keep equipment out of sight except um, when it's being shown to or used on the child. Um, they do fear that bodily harm, intrusion, uh, body mutilation. Um, so you wanna point out on a drawing or a doll or the child where the procedure is gonna be performed and let them know that no other body part will be involved. Um, again, using non-intrusive procedures. Uh, applying an adhesive bandage over a puncture site because they do believe you stuck a needle inside them that their blood can all fall out. So again, we're, we're helping to maintain their body integrity by putting a Band-Aid on. Um, please note that anything that involves genitals will provoke anxiety. Let kids wear their underwear. Um, also explain any unfamiliar situations, especially lights or noises. Uh, striving for initiative. Here you want to involve uh, the child in the care whenever. So like holding equipment or helping to remove a dressing, especially like the tape, sometimes that can hurt a little bit. Um, so letting them to, uh, allowing them to do it can um, really give them a little bit of a sense of control. Uh, give choices whenever possible, but avoid excessive delays. And then you want to praise the child for helping and attempting to cooperate. You never want to shame the child for a lack of cooperation. School age. So here, obviously, they have an increase in language skills and they're interested in acquiring knowledge. So here you can <clears throat> explain procedures using the correct terminology, explain the reason for the procedure using simple diagrams of anatomy and physiology, explain function and operation of equipment in concrete terms, allow the child to manipulate the equipment. You can use a doll or another person as a model to practice using the equipment whenever possible. Uh, note that a doll might seem kind of childish for the older school age child, so that's fine for younger school age. Um, and then allow time before and after a procedure for any kind of questions or discussions. Uh, because of their improved concept of time, teaching sessions can be a little bit longer, maybe 20 minutes, and you can prepare them in advance of the procedure, whereas previously you wanted to do it like, like immediately before. Um, you wanna gain their cooperation, let them know what you want them to do and give them methods of uh, coping and how to, to stay in control in themselves. So that could be deep breathing, relaxing, counting. Um, strive for industry is something that they're doing at this point in their development. So you wanna give them some responsibility for simple tasks like um, maybe collecting specimens or letting them know we need to collect their urine. So make sure that every time that they go to the bathroom that they put the urine receptacle device in the toilet for the females and the males please to void in the urinal. Um, include the child in decision-making, uh, the time of day to perform a procedure or a preferred site if there's choices. Um, encourage active participation. Uh, develop relationships with peers. So you might be able to prepare two or more children for the same procedure um, at the same time or encourage one to help uh, prepare another person. And then provide privacy from peers during procedures to maintain their self-esteem. Adolescents, here uh, they're developing that abstract reasoning. So here you can supplement explanations with reasons why procedures are necessary or beneficial. Um, you can also talk about long-term consequences of procedures and realize that adolescents may fear death, disability, or other potential risks. Um, you wanna encourage questioning um, regarding any fears, options, or alternatives of care. They're very conscious of their appearance, so please provide privacy. Um, discuss how the procedure might affect their appearance, like they might have a scar and what can be done to minimize it, and then emphasize any physical benefits of the procedure. Um, they are concerned more with the present than the future, so realize that immediate effects of a procedure are more important than future benefits. 
uh, striving for independence. So here you want to involve them in decision making and planning. Um, imp impose as few restrictions as possible. Suggest methods of maintaining control. Accept regression to a more childish method of coping. And then realize that adolescents may have difficulty in accepting new authority figures and may resist complying with procedures. Lastly, developing peer relationships and group identity as part of their development. So here, uh, remember they are very, very important. And you, you can do really is allow adolescents to talk with other adolescents who have had the same procedures. So when we were talking about the benefits of play before in the hospitalized child, they referenced a box in uh, chapter 20. So here is that box, uh, play activities for specific procedures. So for fluid intake, what can we do to encourage that? Well, here, making ice pops using the child's favorite juice. Um, cut gelatin into fun shapes. Make a game out of taking a sip when turning a page of a book or in games such as Simon Says. Use small medicine cups or decorate the cup. Cold water with food coloring or a powdered drink mix. Have a tea party, pour at a small table, cut straws in half and place in a small container because it's much easier for the child to suck using a shorter straw. Maybe use a crazy straw. Uh, make a progress poster and give rewards for drinking at predetermined uh, quantity. Deep breathing, so what can we do here? Blowing bubbles with a bubble blower. Blow bubbles with a straw, no soap, because we don't want them to drink the soap. Uh, blowing a pinwheel, feather, whistle, a harmonica, a balloon, but remember if the balloon pops, we're gonna take that away because we don't want anybody choking. Um, or a party blower. Uh, they can practice a band instrument. Um, having a blowing contest using balloons, uh, cotton balls, you're gonna see how far they can blow them across the table, feathers, marbles, ping pong balls. So there's a lot of things that you can blow on a tabletop and you can have a goal line and see who can get it, make it a game and make it go, see who can go over that um, goal line first. Um, <clears throat> uh, you can suck paper or cloth from one another uh, using a straw, which is actually kind of a fun thing to do. Um, Dramatized stories such as I'll huff and puff and I'll blow your house down from three little piggies. So you can have them blow the house down. Uh, obviously you gotta take a big deep breath before you do that. Um, they can do something called a uh, straw blow planing where they can uh, paint using a straw. Um, taking a deep breath to blow out candles on a birthday cake. Range of motion and use of extremities. So here you can have them throwing bean bags at a fix or movable target, um, throw a wadded up paper into a waste basket, um, touch or kick balloons or balls if that's possible. Um, obviously we wanna be careful in the hospital, we don't wanna break anything. Um, you can play tickle toes. Um, so you can just like tickle their little toes and have them wiggle their toes on request. Um, playing Simon Says. Um, you can uh, play pretend and so you can imitate a bird flying. Um, you can have a tricycle or uh, wheelchair races in a safe area. So some hospitals actually have areas where they're able to do that. Um, and that's obviously uh, great for range of motion. Um, playing kickball, obviously if they have an area where that's safe to do so or throwing a ball with a soft foam ball. Uh, so again, so things don't break. Um, uh, they have different kinds of climbing walls. So some hospitals have those. Um, you can just even do like a very general uh, range of motion exercises and you just wanna make it fun. Um, some hospitals have swimming. Again, if they have um, an IV, then that's gonna be something that you're gonna be making sure that we keep that out of the water um, or protect it from water. Uh, video games or pinball here that encourages fine motor movement, um, playing hide and seek so they can walk around their room and hide so that can get everything moving. Um, playing with uh, Play-Doh can actually help with uh, the fine motor movements. Um, encouraging to play beauty shop. So the combing of the hair again is going to um, encourage range of motion of the upper extremities. 
Um, they have things like marbles uh, and they can play with that. And that again is really that fine finger movement. Um, if you're looking at uh, soaks, um, that's another thing that children, they might have a therapy where they're soaking in water. Um, so here, what you can do is have them wash a doll, um, either talking about uh, playing with marbles. So here it's, they can actually pick the marbles up out of the water. Um, they can make designs with the coins on the bottom of a container while they're sitting in the water. You can read to the child during water. You can play a game, you can play checkers. Um, if they need a sits bath, so that means they're sitting on water and often it may, it may be whirling. Um, you can give them something to listen to. Um, so injections here, you want to let them handle a uh, needleless syringe, the vial and alcohol swab. Um, you can let them uh, give the injection to a doll or a stuffed animal. Um, you can draw a magic circle uh, around the area before the injection. And then afterwards, you can even draw a smiley face, but don't just don't draw on the puncture site. Um, if you know you're gonna, they're gonna get a lot of injections, you might make a progress poster and they get a reward after however many injections that they get. Um, and when you're giving the injection, have the child um, look away and take a big deep breath and then count to 15 super fast and that often can distract them. So ambulation, giving them something to push. So a toddler, uh, a push-pull toy. A school-age child can give, have a wagon or a doll in a stro stroller or a wheelchair. An adolescent, giving them a decorated IV stand. Um, have a parade on the unit. Uh, and then in terms of the extended environment for like a patient in traction, um, here, it's moving the bed frequently to the playroom, the hallway, or outside. Uh, they might not be able to get out of the bed, but you can move them so they can experience other areas and not just be stuck in their room. So just kind of a little FYI, small objects such as marbles and coins, as well as gloves and balloons are unsafe for young children because of possible aspiration. So um, anything that is small enough to be put in a toilet hole, uh, 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 the toilet paper cardboard, um, you do not want to give that to a child really th three to four or under, okay, because they can choke on that. Also, latex products carry the risk of allergic reactions. So uh, we're going to talk about children with spina bifida that do have a high risk of um, developing latex allergies. So you want to avoid anything with latex, especially with children that have spina bifida. Uh, lastly, we're going to talk about some pediatric procedures. Um, here, personal hygiene, it's really dependent on the child's age and development. You want to teach them about appropriate self-care safety, uh, no electronic equipment near the water, um, daily health habits should be typically like what they do at home, um, let the parents participate, get everything that they need, uh, make sure that the child's not gonna slip in the bathtub. Often this can be accomplished by maybe putting like a little towel at the bottom. Uh, make sure that they're brushing their teeth. Um, oral care is often neglected. Um, hair care often is also neglected. So if it needs to be washed, um, if it was tingled, um, you can put some kind of lubricant in it first and then comb it and then um, wash it. So safety, if the side rail is down or the isolate is opened, your hand must be on the child at all times. Parents also need to do the same thing. It is absolutely critical that we keep the child safe and we don't want them to fall out of their cribs. Restraints, so here we wanna use the least amount to be effective. Um, they've got mummy restraints, uh, which basically allow for treatment of the head, neck, and chest. Um, you also can do a modified mummy restraint where you can leave one arm out. Um, elbow restraints are good for preventing a child from scratching their face or if they've had facial plastic surgery, eye patches, or um, scalp veins. Um, so elbow restraints are, are really common with um, children that have uh, cleft lip or cleft palate procedures. Uh, jacket restraints, you want to keep 
uh, a child in a wheelchair or a high chair or to keep them supine, that might be when you see something like that. Um, arm and leg restraints, it's usually used to immobilize one or more extremity, again, to help uh, prevent them from uh, disrupting care. Uh, feeding techniques, just FYI, the feeding, when you're using a feeding tube, if you're gonna insert um, a nasogastric tube, uh, typically the measurement for children is the nose to the uh, earlobe to halfway between the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. So it's a little bit further than an adult, okay? So that's a little bit of a different. Um, positioning them on the right side can help facilitate the digestion. Um, and if a child is being bottle fed, uh, please keep them upright or use a bent bottle because this helps to decrease gas. Intake and output. For children in diapers, what you're gonna do is you're going to weigh a clean diaper first. You're gonna put the clean diaper on the scale and then you're gonna zero the scale. So if the diaper is on the scale, you press zero. And when the scale says zero, you take the clean diaper off and then you put the dirty diaper on and then the number will come up and then that's how many milliliters that the diaper weighs. Or if it's stool, that's the number of grams that it weighs. Um, if you need to apply a urine collection bag um, on females, especially, it's going to be very important that you uh, obviously you want to wash the area, dry the area very well. And on little girls, you're going to apply the urine bag to the perineum first and then go up. So as I mentioned before, please review the entire chapter 20 regarding the differences in children care. Okay, uh, this concludes the presentation for week two, part A. So please be sure to watch the part B presentation. Thank you and have a nice day.